you want to. So welcome, nice to have you here. Um, this is the commencement of a series of studies, a brand new set of series of studies on Joseph, which is, we haven't, we haven't looked at Joseph for years, apart from all year this year with the young people for uh, NCYC. So apologies in that respect, but um, we're going to keep it really short. It's a series of uh, three nights and uh, we're going to look at some great detail. But anyway, we'll get into that in a little, little bit. So, so nice to have you all here as we begin our series um, of, for three nights uh, on, on the study of Joseph. Uh, we've been meaning, Bob and I have been meaning to do the study of Joseph since Joseph was born. And we finally got around to it 24 years later. So, and Josie's not here to hear it. And Josie is downstairs <laughs> doing Gosford's Bible class, so <laughs> um, you'll miss him. So if, if for those of you who have already heard enough of Joseph, you can pop downstairs if you prefer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can have the Zoom link. Um, we won't do a reading for this evening. I apologise for those who uh, love readings. Um, we're already well underway in terms of timing and we've got a little bit to get through tonight. Um, Phil's speaking at Southlake. And Phil is speaking at Southlake. Yeah, we'll talk to That's on Sunday. <laughs> so if you want Phil's link, we can send you Phil's link as well. <laughs> Uh, um, so you've got a multi-choice answer evening uh, but hey sure you do generate some fine speakers that's all i can say on that. um so joseph is a remarkable character study and um over the time that i've been spending a little more detail in that area of joseph i've been brought to tears quite literally I've been humbled, I've been amazed, I've been in awe, uh, and I've been so grateful of the opportunity, one, to study it, two, to continue to develop my character uh, based off um, the wonderful example of Joseph and um, how fitting it is that uh, as an ecclesia we can consider it and how beautiful it is that the young people are also considering it um, throughout the year as well. So... Um, hopefully there can be some robust discussion, if nothing else, uh, around tonight's discussions and the following two evenings, God willing. So tonight at a glance, um, by numerical order there, one, two, through to six, uh, we're going to look at this in, in uh, a top-level detail, if you like. We're not going into any finite detail with only three evenings, um, but study one at a glance is we're going to look at from his birth through to, I guess, sold into slavery as, as one of three evenings. Um, so his parents, then we're going to look at the favour of, of Joseph, the topic of the dreamer, despised and envied, plotted against to be killed and sold into slavery. And that's hopefully we'll get up to that tonight and we'll uh, move on into um, the middle part of his life, if you like, in our, in our next evening together, God willing. Um, oh, nice to see you join as well, Jim. Welcome. <clears throat> so, God's purpose with planet Earth. Why on earth would we start at this as a topic on Joseph? Well, the wonderful thing about Joseph is, and this theme will come out, uh, God willing, in our discussion tonight and over the um, um, series to, uh, over the next three evenings, um, is that Joseph looked forward to the plan and purpose of God. And that's a wonderful characteristic of Joseph. He was a forward thinker and he didn't let the obstacles and the trials and the tribulations of his own life get in the way of what God's plan and purpose was and he looked forward to it with great anticipation. God in the very beginning gave all of us, if you like, premised with Adam and Eve for an example uh, of a clear and, and simple um, test to prove and develop character. And, of course, that we know full well what happened with Adam and Eve. And since then, God, through Joseph's life, through to the book of Revelation, through to our life today, is about developing our mortal characters to be like his. Through proof of trial may be transformed upon acceptance at judgment into immortal, perfect beings capable of serving God forever. And this is one of the foremost things that Joseph, in his own life, was able to uh, keep in the, in the forefront of his mind in all of his life 
and in every aspect of it. And we'll see that as it's developed through. Uh, so <clears throat> God's purpose with the earth, which is what Joseph understood really, really well, is this. In the development of God's promise, he explained what his purpose was. Numbers 14, 21, who can recite that for me? Very good. As truly as I live, all the earth will be filled with my glory. And, and Moses said to God, um, show me this glory, please. And, and God does. And what is his glory? It's his, it's his character, isn't it? Well, Joseph understood this message. And I'm at pains to explain this from the outset of our um, studies here tonight. Joseph clearly understood, and we'll see this as we see in the development of his character, what he understood of what God's plan and purpose was with the earth. And it was his ideal, it was his plan and purpose to match what God's plan and purpose was, to fill the earth with a character that he could be the very best he could be in his service to God. And it astounds me that this character of Joseph was able in all of the trials and all the tribulations that he endured to manifest to the best of his ability almost perfectly and as a type of Christ, a wonderful example of that in his life. Now, I apologise, it's not as clear up on the screen as it is on my screen, but this depicts um, a bit of a summary of Joseph's life and we're not even going to really tell the story of Joseph's life. I think we all know it fairly well either through Sunday school and then, of course, the development through this year uh, for, for uh, young people particularly and for all those on Zoom who have been through uh, studies of Joseph similar and or um, considered it for yourself. We know the story really, really well. So we're not going to go into the depth of it, but we will touch in various aspects of it. If there are questions, of course, or it's not clear enough, then please pull me up at any stage. But look at some of the um, trials there that you see depicted on the screen. Um, we've got Joseph, of course, as um, the head of um, Egypt, almost in the, depicted in the middle there. You've got his brothers throwing him down a pit in, in a, about to be sold into slavery. You've got in the, in the background there probably Jacob despairing that he's lost his son. Um, he's contemplating over to the left, his brothers bowing down to him. Um, Potiphar's wife probably there also. So there's a lot captured in, in there, and we'll look at some of those aspects as we move through our evening together. How about this if you look at Joseph's life? How was it summed up by the book of Hebrews? And we know Hebrews chapter 11 really well. It's the book of faith, right? And it depicts those characters that um, probably Paul is writing of in Hebrews and at chapter 11. Uh, from the NIV version, by faith Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. This is an amazing thing. So if you were to look at all of the, the faithfulness, if you like, of Joseph's life, the writer has seen fit to depict the summary of all of Joseph's faithfulness summarised in this aspect, and that was he gave commandment concerning his bones and where they were to be buried. In other words, he understood full well what God's plan and purpose was with the earth. He understood full well that the nation would be visited as a, as a group of slaves, if you like, in Egypt. They would be brought up out of Egypt into the promised land and there they would be living in fulfilment of God's direct plan and purpose uh, in a primary application and then in a secondary fulfilment when Jesus returns again. Joseph knew all this in his own life. And you've got to remember, we're, we're at the very, very beginning of the Bible. This is Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. The law hasn't come. There's very little written at this point of anything of God's plan and purpose with the earth, but Joseph understood it. That's a powerful lesson for us. Sometimes I think we often think, well, is 66 books, is, is that all we've got, really? Is that, is that enough for us? Think about Joseph, what he was able to achieve as a character, as an example. Think about what he knew in the very little information that was recorded at this point in time of the 66 books. So let's move on to the first aspects of our evening tonight. Um, if you've got a Bible or uh, hopefully Paul's not listening, if you've got your phone or iPad, let's have a look at... Um, Genesis in a chapter, oh, 
glasses are heaps. Genesis chapter 35. And let's have a look at the introduction to um, Joseph by his parents. Uh, chapter 35 and verse 16. It's a sad introduction in many ways as we begin the entry of Joseph's life, but at some point we need to enter into the lives of his parents. And at this point, sadly, Rachel is passing away. Verse 16, they journeyed from Bethel and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath, and Rachel travailed and she had hard labour. And it came to pass when she was in hard labour, the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And so she has the son, she passes away, but the son is named Benjamin. And Rachel dies in verse 19 and was buried. And there Jacob sets a pillar upon her grave. And Israel journeyed and spread his, and spread his tent beyond the Tower of Edah. So just a little point here in respect to Jacob and Rachel. These are Joseph's parents. You'll note there that Rachel died very early in Joseph's life. So Joseph was born. There was two sons to Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin. Joseph obviously had been born. He was the elder. And then Benjamin was born. And sadly, Joseph loses his mother. But when we consider the example of Joseph as a character, there's a lot of credit to be given to the mother because at an early age, and I know this is similar to uh, Jacob's life, to Joseph's <coughs> life, to our life today, the credit largely falls to the development of children at a young age by their mother. And it's not to say that the father's influence doesn't come to bear in their life, but usually that's much later. And Jesus, as an example, said to Mary, and we'll look at this a little bit later, at the age of 12, I must be about my father's business. In other words, his mother had developed into a point where now he must be about his father's business. But Joseph's character was developed to such a point that it was able to, um, he was able to work through all of the trials and temptations and challenges in his life by the earliest of influences of his parents. And for parents and children alike, as we consider that for ourselves today, I think that's a marvellous example. Another little point that the scripture makes very clearly here is in verse uh, 20 and 21. In verse 20, it's Jacob setting a pillar upon her grave. In verse 21, it's Israel journeyed and spread his tent. What's the difference? Well, the difference is, of course, that Israel was given uh, the name to Jacob after the wrestling with, with the uh, angel. And it depicted a larger presence of the promise that was to be fulfilled through his seed. And it's almost like a turning point in scripture. Rachel has passed away. Jacob has now got this enormous uh, burden on his shoulder to continue on the faithfulness of his forefathers, Abraham and Isaac. And as we develop this chapter and our thoughts in it, the person that really... Um, is highlighted the most in these next chapters of Genesis through to about chapter 50 odd is who? It's Joseph. So Israel moves forward. But it really is the story of Joseph. And Joseph is depicting what God's plan and purpose is with the earth and the fulfillment of those great promises made to Abraham, made to Isaac, and made to Jacob. And so we move forward in our study together on this as well. Jacob had a brother as well, as you will recall. His name was Esau. In chapter 36, as we move forward uh, in our reading, says this in verse 1, Now these are the generations of Esau, who is Edom. And Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan, and so on. And it depicts all of the generations of Edom. And most of them are called dukes, not dukes of Hazard, although they may have been hazardous. But they were dukes. Come across, uh, come across if you will, to chapter 37, though. Same language. In verse 2. So chapter 36 says, these are the generations of Esau. And then chapter 37 says this. These are the generations of Jacob. 
Well, what's it all about? What's Jacob's generations? What does it say? Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. What an amazing contrast. What's the scriptures telling us? It's not that it doesn't tell us anything about Jacob's generation, uh, see, but the contrast here in language of chapter 36 to chapter 37 is this. Esau sought a life that was full of himself, and it was about title, esteem, everything he could get out of, him, of himself, and he built his cities and he gave his children titles. And everything of the world was appealing to them. Of Jacob, does anyone remember what it said of Jacob in his earlier life, what he was? Assyrian ready to perish. Assyrian ready to perish. It wasn't quite on my mind, but that's probably true, James. Sorry. A dweller of tents. Dweller of tents. A dweller of tents, he was, yep. So Jacob was a dweller of tents. Esau was a man that was out for the very best of himself and to get as many titles as he could. And we know the contrast between Edom, which is what the inheritance of um, Esau was, and, and the Canaan land um, or the land of Cana as, as Joseph uh, dwelt in there for a period of time. So there's no mention of Dukes. There's no mention of any other ones. It just starts to mention Joseph. And I think this is an important emphasis that the Scripture is making. From here through to chapter 50 nearly, is the importance of a character that the Bible seems to give so much um, over to in, in review and of, and of um, reference to this wonderful character. And, and hopefully we'll see over the next three evenings why it's so important for us as well. That was Jim? I think, I think Jim's tuned in. There was a toot outside, Jim. We're suggesting it may have been you. Jem goes past. I don't know how many times you go past the day, Jem. Ah, yeah, he's just tuned in. He's not really there. Yeah, about about four or five times a day, I think. About four or five times a day. So Jem gets about four or five texts from me every day because he toots as he goes past, and it's an always a cheery toot. Thanks for that, Jem. <laughs> um. Right, the next point on this slide, how do we compare? If you consider the book of 2021 and verse March, that's about where we are today, right? I don't know if any of you have read that uh, particular book in the Bible. It's not quite there. However, there is one reference to us, and we've already looked at it. It's found in Hebrews chapter 11, and it's right at the end of chapter 11. And it says that all of these faithful people, including the man Joseph, they without us will not inherit this promise. In other words, the us that the Hebrew writer is talking about is not just to the Hebrews themselves, but it's to all of those who espouse to be Hebrews. And from Galatians chapter 3, those who are Abraham's or Isaac's or Jacob's or Joseph's seed and are of Christ's, are heirs according to the promise. So in this study of Joseph, for us to consider, I'm really trying to focus on what it really means to us. It's all very well to study a character, and it's great to compare a character to a character, if you like. There might be examples of Joseph to Jesus, and that's certainly something we'll look at in our last class. But how do we compare? What is it that gives us something to take away from? What is it that gives us something to glean out of his life? Well, I think we've touched on it already, but I just want to mention it probably in emphasis again, and that is this. Joseph was 17 years old, as it's, as it's described here in the chapter uh, of chapter 37 uh, and verse 2. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren and it goes on to describe his life. And it would appear that there's not much time um, between his age of 17 and when he goes down, sold into slavery, into Egypt. So the first 17 years of Joseph's life are remarkable in the fact that it put him in good stead for the rest of his life 
of uh, how long did he live for? Anyone remember? 140, I think it was, or 110? 110. 110. Or was that Jacob? 110. We'll go with 110. John was right on the last answer. So for the first 17 years of his life. So what's the importance? What's the takeaway for us? Uh, we were talking the other night, and I think it was last week, just around the dinner table, an expression came up. I think it's from the Roman Catholics, and they says, give me a child to the age of eight. eight or nine, whatever it is, and I'll have them for life. That's a Roman Catholic expression. In other words, if I've got them for the first eight years or nine years of their life, they're pretty much ingrained into what they're going to do for the rest of their life. 110. John is on fire tonight. You, you would think he was doing his study on first John, but he's actually highly tuned into Joseph. And he lollies. <laughs> lollies next Jack week. Does. It's not fair for those on Zoom. <laughs> um, so here's the thing for us. Us parents, how amazing and critical it is to give our children the very best we can give them in support, in nurture, in moral support, in spiritual intake, in their uh, network around them, in the attendance of the things that they do or the things that they don't do, equally important. And for, for all of us who are were 17 or are 17, a little younger, a little older, what's the important lesson for us? Well, the important lesson is sometimes your parents do know what's best. In fact, most often they always know what's best. It's just that you haven't realised that yet. And over a period of time, and I'm at the age of 45 now, that might surprise you. I know I look only 20 still, but I'm 45. Six, six, I'm 46. 46? 46. Yeah, I'm 46. Um, I've come to realise that the loving blessings of being raised in a family that loved God with all of their heart, as much as it pained me at times when all of my friends at school, and we didn't grow up in a, a Christadelphian heritage school, of course, in those days, were off doing all sorts of other wonderful things, in my opinion. I am so pleased now that my father and my mother nurtured me in a way that brought me to the very place that I am here today in God's grace. And I think that is a very important thing for us to hold on to dearly as an ecclesia. Apologise for the eye stock. I couldn't get rid of it. <laughs> Mary did. Mary did so sort of gently say, oh, Dad, you sure you want to really put that one in? But, yeah, I do. We talked about at the outset of our class, Joseph being somebody who was um, thinking clearly and he could see the future. Sometimes it's really difficult, particularly if you're going through trials and tribulations like Joseph did in his life. It's very difficult to see anything further than right here. <laughs> You're right in front of your nose. In fact, sometimes you don't even want to open your eyes. You don't even want to crawl out of bed, I'd imagine. So here we are. We're at 2020, and we're looking down the path to the kingdom. And this is the lesson, this is the take-home for us. We're going to have trials. We're going to have tribulations in our life. We either been through them, we're going through them, we're about to go through them. That's an acceptance that we take on board when we become a human. We don't have much choice in it, but it's the acceptance that God wants us to take on board. And Joseph is a wonderful example of how to take it on board. And he looked at 2020 or he looked at BC, whatever year it was, the equivalent of our 2020, and he looked down that path and he saw the kingdom. And he saw that God had promised that they would make the promised land. And that's why he said to them from Hebrews chapter 11, as a summary of that, he gave commandment concerning his bones that I want them not in Egypt, I want them in. Anyone know where his bones were buried eventually? Shechem. Shechem. And we may even get to that in our second class. Well, here's something for you. For those on Zoom, it might be a little easier. <clears throat> what I'd like you to do, if you can, is there's a blue object at the very bottom of the screen on the right-hand side. Can you see that? 
Have a look at it for 30 seconds and tell me what you see. 30 seconds. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone seen this before? No. no. <laughs> they do actually get better than this as we go through our presentation. So if it's not making a lot of sense to you, you're not the only one right there. What can you see? Anything happen? A blue object. A blue object. Does anything else happen? Yeah, it all disappears. It all disappears. What happened? If you stare at the blue thing oh, and open your eyes really wide and stare really hard, <laughs> then everything around it disappears. Why? No, one will, no, one willing, yeah. no one willing it to disappear. <laughs> so for those of you it may not have worked for and or if you didn't hear Tilly, <laughs> but what happens is that there are objects around us. Now, just compare this to our life today and just pretend for a minute the blue object is God. So there's all this stuff, this peripheral stuff happening in our life. Joseph, God, wants us. He shows the example. Tune in to me. All the rest will just disappear. And this is the example of Joseph's life, by practical example. James not getting it, but he has trials in his life and they just disappear. Oh, where? I'll send you the slide. <laughs> it works. <laughs> yeah. All right. We've got a couple more of those to come. That wasn't. <laughs> That's because your eyes are shut. You're oh, teaching blasphemy. God can't disappear. Very good. All right. <clears throat> what are we up to? Favoured. We've got a bit to get through, so I'll need to move a little quicker. I'm sorry. Um, it is no surprise and it is of no um, great consequence as we read that Joseph was highly favoured. I think it's in Genesis chapter 37, and we've got a quote there of 1 to 4. Um, let's have a look at verse 3. Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colours. Now, if anything, in all of the, 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 the verses of the study of Joseph, I think this one is probably the most misunderstood. Um, what I would suggest to you is this. Jacob was a most faithful man. Rachel was a loving mother. The reason he was favoured, if you like, of the, the and I don't know if there's a better expression either in the ESV or the NIV, et cetera. I haven't looked at the exact detail of the Hebrew. But the reason jo Joseph was favoured is this. Jacob saw in Joseph something that he never saw in any of the other sons. And that's by example as we move through the, the, the study of Joseph. And the reason he saw something in Joseph that he didn't see in the other of his brethren is that Joseph loved God's plan and purpose. And it's very plain as we see the example of his brothers as we move through from dreamer to despise to plotted against to be killed that they thought completely opposite in, in fact. Jacob loved Joseph not so much because he was of beautiful countenance or handsome to look upon than the others. It was because he loved God the most, I would suggest. And the scripture is eloquent as it is clear to show that God loves those who love him. And Jacob, in this sense, was a spiritual father to Joseph as well as a natural father. And he loved Joseph because in Joseph was a countenance that was full of God's desire, and that was he wanted God's plan and purpose to be fulfilled on this earth. So he was certainly favoured. Genesis chapter 37, verse 13 says this, though. Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said, Here am I. Two things out of that verse. Jacob was not soft on Joseph. He was prepared to make him do his fair share of work, just like the other brethren, even though he was much younger, obviously. And Joseph, his response was, here am I. Echoes of Samuel, the prophet Samuel, or the boy Samuel at that particular time, speak, Lord, here am I. 
And there's other examples of beautiful characters that spoke to God or to their fathers and said, here am I. So here's the beautiful example of Joseph. Yes, he was favoured. He was favoured because God favoured him because he knew God's plan and purpose and he had a desire to be favoured in God's eyes. Do we have a desire to be favoured in God's eyes? That's the question for us, I guess. When it's asked of us, whether it be an ecclesial activity, whether it be turning to the Bible class, whether it be turning our attention to Scripture in our own personal study, whether it be turning our attention to God in meditation each morning to seek his blessing and his guidance on our day, whether it be simply just yes to our parents, is our example of Joseph's here am I. Joseph was highly favoured, but there was a very good reason for it. And you know what? God highly favours those that are just like Joseph. And here we are sitting here today, 2021, around this room today, and sometimes I think it can be very easy for us to say, oh, these, these examples in Hebrews 11, you know, we had a study by Brother Rick Steele just a Sunday or two ago, the A and the B class as he, as he determined them. You know, we often think them as the A and we're the B. And he was at pains to, to highlight to us that we are all of the same class. God favours all of those who love him and love Jesus' appearing and his plan and purpose with the earth. Joseph was a forward thinker. He knew God's plan and purpose and he desired to be a part of it. And therefore he was favoured. Well, he was a dreamer too, wasn't he? Um, Genesis chapter 37, verse 5 to 11, um, talks about the dream of Joseph. I think you know them pretty well. We're not going to go into any detail. Our time doesn't permit us to do so really. But the emphasis on this particular point, if nothing else is this, Joseph was able to describe quite clearly what those dreams were and there was an obvious message to them. We'll see what that obvious message was as we move forward in our studies and particularly, uh, I think, in study two. It'll either be study two or study three, and we'll see the development of them. I don't want to, to dwell too much more on, on this particular aspect of, of a dreamer, but simply to say that um, there were two things out of these, these um, retributions, if you like, from his brethren and even his father. Uh, one, his brethren envied him, and they despised him at the same time because of his dreams and the way he, he, he spoke of them and perhaps how they interpret them to be. And Joseph and Jacob even uh, rebuked him. Uh, and his father rebuked him in verse 10 of chapter 37 and said, what is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? And his brother, brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. We'll have a look at that expression in the next couple of slides. Well, we often think about ourselves and we think, well, we've never been given a dream from God. We've never been given a vision. We've never been any of these great things. This is the view that God may have. We often look up, right? But this is the view that God may look down on us. And here we are in today, 2021. We're no different to Joseph. We've been given a dream. It's the 66 books in front of us. We understand the interpretation of it. We understand the message of it, and one day we will see the fulfilment of it. So he was despised and he was envied. We've read a little of that in, in chapter 37 and verse 10 and 11. It's interesting to note out of this that um, he was hated, he was despised, and he was envied. When he was despised, it's talking about uh, the brethren perceiving the dream of them and Joseph. When he's envied, it's the brethren are interpreting the dream, and it's found in verse, um, verse 9. Behold, I've dreamed a dream, and the sun and the moon and the 11 stars made obeisance to me. In other words, the brethren, the, his brethren, his brothers, if you like, uh, were at, at pains to understand that one dream was they knew were talking about himself. The next dream was talking of a higher level again. 
the sun, moon and stars, royalty if you like, and for that they envy him. So the scripture is at pains to point out these two comparisons. When it's just talking of him and his family, they despise him. When he elevates the dream and the interpretation of it, in their opinion, they become envious. How about that for us today? Sometimes we can find challenges with either our friends, our brothers and sisters, those around us, sadly. We can either be despised or we can despise. We can either be envied or we can envy. We can be just like those brothers sometimes, I'm imagining in my own mind. I sure I can be. I wonder if we all think that way sometimes. Well, here's a thing to take on board. Jacob observed the say in his heart. He says in verse, uh, verse 10 of chapter 37, he says his father rebuked him, but he took it in his heart. Now, Mary did the same of Jesus. Um, when she came looking for Jesus, he found him in the temple. You know, he'd been missing for a few days, wasn't it? A couple of days, three days. They found him in the temple and he said, I must be about my father's business. Don't you understand this? And, and, and it says of Mary of the same thing. She took it into her heart. The wisdom of listening and thinking on these things. So here's a challenge for us, and it's particularly more for the older ones amongst us. And I, I don't have any age category of this. <laughs> but sometimes we can be told things we don't necessarily like to hear. We may not even understand it at the time. We may, we may choose to misinterpret. It might even hurt us because it's a little bit of advice that either close friends or friends or brothers and sisters have taken it upon themselves to, to share with us. It is the worst thing in the world that we can possibly do is to shut the door on their face and walk away. Advice is a wonderful thing and the interpretation of it can often be misguided by our own selves because of our envy, because of our pride, because of our despising of us feeling a little put out with our hurt feelings. But iron sharpeneth iron, the scripture says, and it's a good thing. It's a good thing to do. And I think Mary and, and jo Jacob, even though they were the elder of these children and should command respect, took it into their hearts and thought about it and pondered it, even though they knew that they should command respect, particularly in those traditional times that the father always commanded respect regardless. All right, here's one for you. Ah, oh, ribs. Was that you? Who said that? Reuben. How many dots are there? Yeah, okay, I'll give you 12. How many can you see at one time? Two or three. Four. Yeah, four. four. Have, we got any, have we got any higher bidders than four? Yeah. Seventeen. Yeah. Seventeen. Six. I can see six at once. The top six. <laughs> three and three. Well, take it from the top professors of psychology in the world, that the most amount of dots that you can see at one time is not necessarily uh, limited by a particular number but it is determined that that's the challenges you can take on all at once in your life. Six at once. How about that? <coughs> and that's just a start. Right, and just that's just the start. <laughs> Dilly wants to see more. She, she can take on more. I can see the top six, so three and three all the time. Okay, so here's the spiritual takeaway because we need to move on. Here's the spiritual takeaway. Joseph, as a character and as a study, endured some of the most horrific and tumultuous trials and tribulations of anyone's life that they should endure. And rather than just concentrate on looking at one thing and not seeing the big picture, <laughs> Joseph was able to continue to look at the big picture. And there were all these trials in his life. They were all happening, some of them simultaneously. Some of them went on for years as he languished in prison, for instance. 
And here's the thing for us. Down. Down, Daisy. Good girl. Here's the thing for us. We may not even know that we're actually under being undertaken in a trial until we're through the other side. So what a great thing it would be is that each morning we ask God's blessing on our day and to guide us and to direct us just like Joseph did every day. And he always had the vision of the kingdom or the vision of the promised land, if you like, at the forefront of his life so that every trial, every challenge, every cruel thing that happened in his life, he was able to take stock of God's grace and know that he could get through with his blessing. Whoa. Uh-oh. 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 <laughs> dear, oh, dear. And I've even got presenter's notes on, so I know what's coming and I still got there too early. Um, so we know the story well of Joseph was plotted against, right? Um, chapter 37, we're in it already, verse 13 to 20. This is where he, his brothers, because of the envy that was built up in their life and they despised him so much, they thought, what can we do? And they said to themselves, here comes the dreamer, as Jacob had sent him to, to, to check on the welfare of his sons. And they plotted against him. How many pieces of silver did they end up thinking it was worth? How many? <laughs> no, you're 21. <laughs> okay, well, that's a uh, that's an add-on. I counted 20 in the verses that I read. <clears throat> um, and, of course, it, it, you can't help but think about the plotting for envy as it's described in the Gospels against Jesus, and it was for 30 pieces of silver. Uh, and Herod, it says of him, he knew that for envy they had delivered Jesus. So he was plotted against to be killed and there's the remarkable difference between why Joseph was favoured in Jacob's eyes and why his brethren were not so favoured, if you like. Jacob loved his children equally in many ways, I'm sure. But it is very difficult to remain loyal and loving and faithful in a relationship, whether it be with your child or otherwise, when they have different aspects and loyalty uh, outside of yours to your God. And you can't challenge that. And and therefore, for those who think differently, this is often the result. For envy or for, for whatever reason, things can get out of hand. And it got out of hand real quick for Joseph's life, sadly. And uh, he was delivered, um, sold into slavery, etc. And we'll get to that in a minute. I think you've seen this. Is it blue and black or gold and white? Gold and white. It's gold and white. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm not even going to talk about it then. How can it be gold? Now, you might think that this is a very, very challenging question, but it's not really if you just think about it. Brown. What colour are the strawberries? Grey. Brown, lucky brown, chocolate, red, chocolate. Don't say that. Well, here's the science behind this one. The colour red has been completely removed from the image, yet people still see red strawberries. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Well, the brain knows that the colour of an object is more useful than the colour of a light source. How amazing. In determining the colour of an object, thus it's trained to ignore information it receives about the colour of a light source. Since your mind recognises that the objects in this photo are strawberries and it knows that strawberries tend to be red, it colour corrects the grey and green pixels in the image to be red. So why is why are we looking at that? Why are we looking at this image and why are we looking at this image? Does that really look gold, Tilly, that dress? Yeah, yeah gold and white. You can see gold in that. Gold. Yeah. So the top part, like the very top pattern, is gold, and then the next right now after that is white. And you can't see the blue. Yeah. Right. I don't know. If I, if I see white, if I see blue and gold, 
Separate. 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 What are you seeing? I mean, yeah. <laughs> this is his goal. That's the real thing. Where's the black? Is the black the top hat? The first hat? The gold is stripes. You want to go back? Joking. Joking. Oh. <laughs> All right. Let's just bring it back for a, for a minute, folks. We're, we're nearly there. Sorry for those on Zoom, you're probably not quite getting the atmosphere here, but uh, there's a little bit of debate going on. Why did we show those particular two, for instance? Um, quite often in life, we can walk through our life with preconceived ideas. And Jacob was no different to that, and nor were his brethren. And so in Jacob's life, or sorry, let's go to his brethren for a minute. In his brethren's world, his brothers, their preconceived idea was that the only way that they could free themselves of the misery of this brother of theirs, the misery in their minds that continued to play upon them being envious of him, uh, him being a burden, despising him, etc. The only way that they could rid themselves of that burden, was to get rid of him. And then if we move to Jacob's life, as Joseph was sold into slavery, and one of the things that the brothers did was that they dipped his coat into um, the blood of a slain animal, if you recall the story, right? And then they presented it to Joseph. The Jacob's, sorry, they presented it to Jacob, I said Joseph. Now, Jacob's preconceived thinking was, oh, the brothers must be right. My sons must be right. They couldn't possibly tell me a lie, firstly. And secondly, his blood on a coat, he must be dead. Now, quite often we will go through trials and temptations and challenges in our own life. We might have been through them, we might be going through them, or we might still have to face them. Our preconceived idea is this, sometimes we think we can do it all on our own with all of the, the things that in our thinking we can get rid of this trial, we can get rid of this temptation, we can get rid of this challenge, the envy in our life or the burden or whatever it may be. We can see things a little differently to how God actually wants us to see them. God only asks of us a very simple solution to get us through in our life and that is Study my character, Joseph, that I've presented here to you from chapters 36 through to 50. It devotes an amazing amount of chapters out of the whole of the book of the Bibles to Joseph's life. And it's for a reason, and this is that. We often bring preconceived ideas in our life because of the lack of thought that we present in our own lives to the challenges that we're going through. And we can often think of our own strength like the brothers did. Oh, we'll just get rid of this child, this challenge, this burden, this this envy that we have, we'll just get rid of it. This is an easy way to do it. And here's the dip that in blood, we'll present to Jacob. And sure enough, Jacob believed them. But it wasn't the case, was it? It was, in Joseph's mind, it was that he was brought to Egypt to save them. And so it is that God brings us the trials and the challenges in our own life. The acceptance of our lot, the trials, the temptations, the success the world around us, Egypt, if you like, puts us to the test every day. God is ever near to guide, to protect, and to heal. Joseph or his brethren, the same household, how do we respond? Do we respond like Joseph and ensure that no matter what, we ha what happens in our life, whatever we're going through, whatever is going to happen, do we keep the kingdom at the forefront of our life? Do we understand that no matter what is going on, God is directing our life just like he directed Joseph's life to bring us to the point, the focal point of what Joseph wanted, his bones to be brought to the promised land. One day, God willing, our bones, our body, our living life, God willing, will be brought to the promised land. And it really, it's what we're teaching our children as well. We're teaching our children to make sure that all of our bodies, our bones, if you like, like Joseph's, are going to be brought to the promised land of Shechem to see 
God's plan and purpose fulfilled ultimately in the life. What do you reckon? Are A and B squares the same shade of colour? No, but they are because it's a trick. Here we go. They are. Oh. Hey? Hey? They're literally not. Oh, they are. I hate these things. <laughs> Here's the thing. It's the round file. It's great. Well, that's bringing us to a close of our thoughts for tonight. Um, what's the purpose of that? Well, not all of us see the same thing. We might actually see the same thing, but we may interpret it different. So here we go. Here's our closing thoughts. Like this little screen up in front of us now shows us, we don't always see things as clearly as we should be able to. And sometimes it might even be that there's a little bit of trickery going on because of our minds, because we're not concentrating or interpreting things on preconceived ideas or we're not gleaning the facts as we should. And all around us are examples of trials. From the youngest or the furthest back in the room over there to here. All around us, we have a trial that we can witness each of our lives. We're all undergoing trial. And we may not always see it as clearly for ourselves that others might be able to help us with or that we can help others with. Joseph's character is a wonderful character that we can study together. And as we go into study two and three, we'll see some of the depth of his character and how we can compare. But don't ever be afraid to reach out and to look at others for examples, for um, support, for strength, and to see how wonderful it is to rely on each other and for what we have that God has given us. Next class, God willing, in a fortnight's time, I believe, uh, trials in patience, Joseph's early years in Egypt. So we'll look at um, his life there before Jacob comes down eventually to um, reunite with him from his grief of having thought he'd lost him. So thank you, everybody, for your time and attention tonight. And um, I trust that uh, there may be some value of what we've looked at tonight and into our next classes, God willing.